Honoring mothers, honoring our Lord. Did you know that Mother's Day is, by some estimates, the top third celebrated holiday in America? Runs right neck and neck there with Valentine's as the, the number three holiday. Over 133 million cards are sent in America for Mother's Day. $21.2 billion spent on gifts and dinners. 69% of those gifts are flowers. Mark and Andrew were busy yesterday delivering flowers. Lots and lots of flowers I'm gathering. More long distance calls made on Mother's Day than any other day of the year. So I began this morning by saying Happy Mother's Day. And I hope that your day is special. There's no doubt that mothering is one of the toughest jobs on the planet. And you love it. You love almost every minute of it, don't you? We probably don't say thanks enough to mothers, and sometimes their job can be really tough. Here's some t statistics taken from a survey of mothers who have children under the age of six. The worst place to change a diaper. Worst place to change a diaper. 47% said a public restroom that did not have a changing table. 27% said the worst place to change a diaper is when no restroom or car is available. So you're having to juggle them here. 18% said airplane bathrooms are the worst place to change a diaper. Most embarrassed in public. What caused the mother to be most embarrassed in public? 14% said diaper leaks. 52% said unrelenting crying or temper tantrums. 12% said they're most embarrassed when their child asks something very embarrassing about another person out in public. Was the first day of school harder on you or harder on your child? 41% said it was harder on them. 26% said it's equally hard on both the mother and the child. And finally, what would you do with an extra hour in your day? 23% said they would catch up on reading. 22% said they would get some extra rest. Sorry dads, just 7% said they would donate that time to some romance. Yes, today we want to celebrate motherhood, but I also realize that some come into the sanctuary with pain in your heart. Because we have some who have not born physical children, but perhaps have mothered others through their actions through the years, such as Lynn has done. When we consider the loss of a mother, it's difficult. It can be really, really challenging. Yesterday I'm in my hometown, we're at the cemetery and putting flowers on the graves and I see this lady walking away from us. She's going over and she cleans off the, the grave site there some and she's got a few flowers and she sat down there on the grave. And you can tell she's weeping. Hard time for her. I go by later and look at the tombstone and her mother passed away in 2014. So it's a tough time for her right now. So for those who are suffering, who are struggling with Mother's Day, I pray that right now God just give you some grace and mercy during this particular difficult season for you. Today I want to share a story about the most famous woman in the Bible, Mary, the mother of Jesus. In John chapter 2, we see this interesting story about how Jesus and his mother, his family, are at a wedding, a family wedding. We don't know exactly which member of his family is getting married, but we know that his mother Mary felt somewhat responsible for the reception at this wedding. In those days, the groom's family bore the responsibility for the wedding reception and celebration. So let's pick up in John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Let's pause here for just a second. Now, weddings are a big deal. We, we know that weddings are a real big deal. Little girls come out of the womb now, immediately starting to watch the TV show, Say Yes to the Dress. 
when when girls I mean when do girls start planning their, their weddings when they're about three years old something like that I mean it, it's it's a lengthy process Amber our daughter's in the middle of her wedding plans right now she's been at it for months and it's still going on and she began to feel some of the pressures from that but weddings bring pressure not just for the the bride or the groom-to-be pastor Marty Baker shared a great story he said, as a pastor, I take weddings pretty seriously. He said, I've been pretty fortunate. I haven't goofed up too many weddings. He said, not too long ago, though, I did have a slip up. I came to the point where the groom was supposed to kiss the bride, but I forgot. He said, I announced the new couple to the audience. I was preparing to walk off the stage when I had this thought, there's something missing here. Oh, yeah, he's supposed to kiss her. He said, but that's not as bad as the pastor who was marrying a couple and the pastor had performed the the marriage ceremony for the groom this was his second marriage he had performed the first marriage for the groom and right in the middle of the ceremony he looks at the new bride-to-be and calls her by the groom's first wife's name you know there aren't enough holes to crawl in when you do something like that as a pastor it's it just happens Wedding days certainly are huge. In Jesus' day, they were a big deal as well. This chapter starts out by saying, on the third day, which tells us that Jesus and his disciples had traveled three days to get to this wedding. So it's, it's important for them to be there. It's some family member we don't know, but it's important for them to be there at this wedding. In those days, it's certainly common for people to travel by foot, by camel, by cart, whatever means they could get transportation. But they know when they go, it's going to be worth the effort. A wedding was not just a one or two hour event. It was a week long celebration. A lot of eating, a lot of drinking, a lot of dancing. For them, it was just going to be a really good time for a week. Let's pick back up in verse 3. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Folks, this is a huge problem. Maybe a pastor shouldn't say it's a huge problem. I don't know. <laughs> but it's a huge problem for, the, for this wedding party. How about that? Because they are out of wine. Okay, now, how many have ever wondered, were they drinking real wine or was it Welch's grape juice? The thought maybe it's crossed your mind, hasn't it? Depends maybe upon your, your church background. If you were reared Catholic, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, even some Methodist churches, you may even be completely unchurched. You're thinking, wine, it's the stuff. It's the fermented stuff. It's the real thing. Baptist, charismatic, Pentecostal. You're probably thinking, well, this is Welch's sparkling grape juice. That's, that's what they have. John, verse 3. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, when we read that, when he says, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? How many think, that seems rude. Why would he talk to his mother that way? Emily's saying, yeah, I think that's rude. It, it, for us, it feels that way. In this time, that term of address was actually a term of respect. You see how we can read something in Scripture and based upon our, our limited awareness of actual events of the time, culture, we can, we can misinterpret that. So he's actually showing respect to his mother in this reply to her. He's saying, Mom, you don't understand. It's not the right time. Have you ever been asked to do something and you know it's not the right time? Or you went ahead and did something and you found out later it wasn't the right time? I've done it way too many times. We do that. He's saying, Mom, you don't understand. It's not the right time. And she was saying, I know you don't think it's the right time, but I need some help. Do mothers have a way of communicating that? I know you have your opinion, but I need some help. Well, that's what she's doing right here. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. You're my son, and um, I need some help. So get over your opinion is what she's really telling him. Because hospitality in the East, this was a sacred duty. In their culture, running out of the wine at a, a wedding... That could be extremely embarrassing for the family. I mean, this could have been humiliating for the bride and the groom. 
And it wasn't like they're going to move off to Seattle or San Francisco or Phoenix. They're going to be living in this area, most likely. And they're going to be carrying this humiliation for years forward. People say, look at them. Mark and Pam ran out of wine. Now, we know Jesus and his family were not people of wealth. And it's a, a good presumption that the people that are involved with this wedding also were not people of wealth. So maybe this was a low-budget wedding. Ever been involved or seen a low-budget wedding? Yeah, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Not at all. I was just told this weekend about a guy, he paid for his daughter's wedding, $80,000. And they were divorced in less than a year. $80,000. So going low budget is not necessarily a bad thing, but in this case, they have run out of wine. So we're talking about public embarrassment, humiliation for the bride and the groom. This wedding meant a lot to Mary. So she's saying to Jesus, I appreciate your, your thoughts, but I need some help. Verse 5, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Jesus understood Old Testament law. Sometimes we, we like to paint Jesus as this radical rabbi who's going against everything from the Old Testament, and that's anything but true. Jesus very much understood and embraced his Jewish heritage, and he understood certainly the Ten Commandments to honor and respect his mother and father. So he steps in. Verses 6 through 8. Now there were Set, there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. What's going on here? Jesus is telling them, fill up these pots. Now they got these pots because for strict Jews, you're going to certainly wash. Wash your hands, wash your feet. You know, you've been traveling. So they're going to have to wash their feet. But they're also going to wash their hands before the meal. In fact, they would wash their hands between every course of the meal. Their utensils are going to be washed during the meal. So they're going to have, for a large wedding, they're going to have six, eight, maybe ten or more water pots, depending upon the size of the wedding party. They're going to have a lot of water available. But some has been used. So Jesus says to the servants, fill the water pots. We've got six of them over here. 20 to 30 gallons apiece. That's a lot of water pots. But they fill them. Why? Because Jesus tells them, mother, mother told the servants. They said, okay. So she's got some responsibility, some sense of charge here. And what happened? As each cup is poured, a miracle occurs. As each cup is taken from the water pot, it's become wine, for it was just water. The first miracle that Jesus ever performed, a behind-the-scenes miracle. Now, who, who sees this? Who knows that they had run out of wine? Jesus' mother, some of the servants, probably the, the master of the feast, the master of the wedding, but the guests, most of them at this point, probably do not know that we're out of wine. So the wine for them just keeps flowing. Jesus is doing this. It's low profile. It's behind the scenes. Because why? He said, my time has not yet come. In time, they will know who I am. But for today, today I'm going to honor my mother. So I'll do this. But it's not going to be, hey, everybody, look here. We're out of wine, but fill up these jugs. And watch what I can do. Not his style. In time. They will know who I am. She's expecting something of Jesus. Do we expect things of our children? Do we expect things sometimes of Jesus? And sometimes Jesus doesn't answer in the manner that we think that he should. There's a problem and Mary needed some help. And some of you are wrestling with problems. Physical problems. Problems with family, problems with finances. You're out of wine, you're out of patience, you're out of money, you're out of. And we are struggling with those. The issues are pressing in and it seems like your life is spinning out of control. You know exactly what I'm speaking of. Are you expecting Jesus to bring you something this morning? Are you expecting him to perform a miracle for you today? Because he can. 
Now we can't always assume that he's going to. Yep, got this headache and it's been going on for four months. Jesus, you got to heal it. He might. But the end, he might not. We don't know what God's plan is. Faith is important, but this is what you need to know. Sometimes things will get worse before God makes them better. Sometimes things will get worse before God makes them better. And you're thinking, Pastor Van, I don't want to hear that. That's not the answer I'm looking for that's going to get worse before it gets better. Because we want to take the pill. We want to get fixed right now. We want all the problems to go away right now. <coughs> God says sometimes it's going to get worse before it gets better. Last week, you know, we, we talked about that last week. The best is yet to come. We see this, this principle being played out in the Bible all the time. Characters in the Bible who lived this. Joseph had to go to prison before he could be exalted to a place of leadership in the kingdom. David had been promised, you're going to be the king of Israel. But what's he doing before he becomes king and lives in the palace? He's hiding in the caves, hiding out, trying to save his life. Peter in the New Testament had to fail before he experienced God's grace and then lead 3,000 people to Christ on the day of Pentecost. Jesus himself had to die on the cross before he could be, re he could be resurrected and we could have forgiveness of our sins. Sometimes it's got to get worse before God will make it better. Can I live with that? Can I accept that? I can't imagine what it's like going to a mission field. Mark and Pam can speak to it. Andrew's going to experience it in a very different fashion in a very short time frame. And many times from discussions we have with missionaries, they go out and they're excited, they're pumped up, they're responding to God's call in their life, and it gets worse before it gets better. We talked with Rick and Teresa Dixon and some others when we were working with Mission Aviation Fellowship. And Liam was asking, what was it like? She's asking particularly the wives, what was it like when you first went to the mission field? And they're there in Africa, or they're in Central America, or they're in South America. And they're talking about the houses and the, the holes in the walls and the scorpions and tarantulas this big around. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. But none of them. Not a single one would trade that experience of what God has allowed them to do working on the mission field. But it's not what we get to live like here. It had to get worse for get better to share God's true love. A lot of us are experiencing worse things. Sometimes we feel like we are out of wine, out of finances, relationships are stuck, or maybe even non-existent. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 10 now the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus will personally restore establish strengthen and support you that's all it says right will personally restore establish strengthen and support you how many of you have ripped out the rest of that verse in your Bible you've taken a black marker and covered it over why? Because I don't want to have that part in my life. That should be for somebody else, God, not for me. After you have suffered a little. I don't want to suffer. I want the good life. But God doesn't promise us that. He says that after you suffered a little, after you suffered a little, then I'll restore, establish, strengthen, and support you. I've not forgotten you while you're going in this. While you're in the midst of it, I've not forgotten you. But you're going to suffer a little between now and then. Can we live with that? We should. We truly should. Here in America, we are just filthy rich compared to most of the world. But we get focused on that we're out of wine. The bonus didn't come in. Your husband, your wife has looked at you and once again said you're not good enough. Your kids have ignored you, screamed at you, yelled at you, I hate you. We don't want that kind of suffering in our life. But God himself said, I will restore you, strengthen you. I'm there for you. God's going to show up and make us better and stronger. We have to look to Jesus for our solutions is our next item. 
we don't lose hope what Jesus did at that wedding he will do for you and you and you and you he will do that for anyone today because he is the problem solver he gives the solutions but where do we typically look we look to other areas other things for solutions got financial problems you know that lottery what's that now about 300 million this weekend for the powerball and it all had to spend two or three bucks and hey if you don't play you can't win so why not it could be me just as well as it could be anybody else but how many people are buying lottery tickets every single week all oh, they occasionally win 10 bucks 100 dollars some win a thousand and what does that do it fuels that several years ago when tennessee was having the debate and the, the boat was upcoming about whether or not we were going to have the lottery here in Tennessee. We'd gone to Cracker Barrel, and there's a young lady who's our server. She'd moved down to Nashville from Louisville. And she was so excited that the lottery was coming in. And I said, well, because they had the lottery for years already in Kentucky. I said, if they get the lottery here, will you play that? Oh, yes, yes. I said, how much do you think you would spend each week? Oh, probably at least $20. Okay, you're working as a server in Cracker Barrel. You're making, what is it, 210 an hour plus tips. But you're already in advance committing $20 a week, $80 a month, $1,000 a year to the lottery. Is that really the best use of your resources? But that's how people do. We, we look to other things. We look to relationships with coworkers inappropriate relationships with co-workers we look to chat rooms we look to the wrong places for our solutions rather than looking to Jesus we need to move from verse 3 where Mary says we're out of wine to verse 10 because Jesus saves the best for last verse 9 and 10 let's look at what happens there when the master of the feast, now the master of the feast was typically a servant. It would be like a, a maitre d', if you will, the, a head waiter. They're, they're not really part of the family, but they're sort of overseeing everything that's going on. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior you have kept the good wine until now you see this guy it's not his first wedding to to MC, if you will to be the master of ceremonies he knows what normally goes on okay you bring out the good stuff and people start getting a little bit drunk and their palate gets sort of wasted and it doesn't begin to taste much after a while so then you roll out the, the cheap stuff you know the muscatel the thunderbird the, the, the boone's farm wine you guys know the cheap stuff right the, the what $2. CVS $2 wine. So they bring out that kind of stuff. Nothing like having a big jug of muscatel there. They won't know the difference, will they? But not you. You didn't do that. You saved the best until last. How much credibility did the groom get in this guy's eyes? He had nothing to do with it. You see, Jesus blessed him, blessed his bride, and they had no clue that he had done that for them. How many times has Jesus done something for you and you didn't know that he had done that for you? He had that accident happen a few minutes before you came up the interstate. We don't know all the times that Jesus has taken care of us. He doesn't come around and say, Hey, Andrew, I want you to know, I'm the one who opened the door for you to get into that missionary organization. I took care of that for you. He doesn't do that. Quiet, unassuming, but powerful, effective. He saves the best for last. Things may get worse before they get better. But remember, Jesus saves the best for last. God's best is coming. Do not lose hope. Hang on. He's going to show up. The miracle is about putting our trust in God. Knowing that he wants to show up. Knowing he wants to work in the behind the scenes stuff. Knowing he wants to be involved in our lives. Working out the miraculous. 
taking out the stress and turning that into joy. But we've got to ask. We've got to listen. That leads us to our final thought. We have to do what Jesus says to do. That may be the hardest part for a lot of people who profess Christianity. The following through, the doing what Jesus says. Boy, I like that part. I like that part about salvation. I like that part about not going to hell. I had sent an email this week. I asked for prayer for me because I was wanting to have a conversation with Harmy Justice this week. He's been on our prayer list for some time. Yesterday, I'm talking with Wilma, and I said, this is going to be a hard sell. This is going to be a hard conversation. I just listened to Harmy the night before. He's, he's got some bitterness. He's got a lot of anger. And she said that she knows a pastor, a pastor friend of hers, who says that at age 12 or 13, Harmy made a profession of faith. And this pastor says, it was heartfelt. It's the first time I've heard this. And that's good. And Wilma told me that she'd had a conversation with Harmy. She asked him one day, she said, don't sugarcoat anymore. She said, do you want to go to hell? He said, I'm not going to go to hell. I'm, and then he stopped. In his mind, I think he knows that if it was that heartfelt as that pastor says it was, he knows that he will not go to hell. But then once we get past that part where Jesus says, you are mine forever. But between now and the time that we go to heaven, how good are we at doing what Jesus tells us to do? Are we bearing the fruit? Are we showing the lifestyle? Are we living like Christ? John 2, verse 5. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Okay, well, I can fill water jugs, Van. I can do that. That's easy. What about the real challenging things that God asks us to do? James 2, verse 17. This is from the NIV. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. It says, faith without action is dead. From the contemporary English version, faith that doesn't lead us to do good deeds is all alone and dead. I've got faith, but I'm not doing anything with it. It's saying your faith is dead from the Amplified Bible. So also faith, if it does not have works, deeds and actions of obedience to back it up by itself, is destitute of power, inoperative, dead. I was convicted this week. I'm convicted frequently. We get the Baptist and Reflector, the, the newspaper from the Tennessee Baptist Convention. And the front page story is talking about revitalization of churches. And there was something in there, just from, I've heard of this before, I've heard it many times, but it just really struck me hard this time. The question they ask is, if your church closed today, would your community notice? I thought, they might notice that the signs aren't here. I felt very convicted by that. Don't know what, but God's going to lead us to do more. And I need you to help me to do that. I can't do it all. I'm not supposed to do it all. You see, we're all supposed to have the deeds and the actions of obedience to go with our faith. It's one thing to talk about going to the mission field, but it's another to go to the mission field. It doesn't have to be China or Central America. Are we willing to go to the mission field right here in Priest Lake and Antioch? And if not, our faith is dead. Whatever he says to you, do it. You can come to church, you can say you believe all day long, but if you're not willing to put that faith into action, your faith is actually dead. Today, today's the day that we begin to honor our Lord by obeying our Lord. We respond. We act. Because Jesus and the servants obeyed, a miracle happened. Mary came to Jesus and said, listen, they're out of wine. You need to do something about it. And Jesus looked at his mother and basically said, no. And she said, don't make me take you out behind the woodshed. Or something to that effect. He said, my time has not yet come. 
She said, that's great that you feel that way, but now your servants, your servants, whatever you, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Jesus recognized for him not to respond would have been disrespectful to his mother. And he wanted to obey the Old Testament command to honor his father and his mother. He worked that miracle. Quietly, behind the scenes, his disciples knew it, the servants knew it, Mary knew it. But he performed the miracle and he honored his mother. No better way to honor your mother today than to put your faith in Jesus Christ. No better way to honor Christ than to put your faith into action. To take steps to actually do what you are called to do and told to do. We, as a church, need to honor our Father by being obedient to his commands.